Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton exchanged blows over foreign policy this week. Political commentator and former Clinton White House advisor Dick Morris is here to handicap the race and discuss his new book. And later, injuries are common in all sports, but my next guest says some sports can be deadly. Forensic pathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu shares his groundbreaking research, his faith, and issues a warning to young athletes. And finally, with the holidays approaching, I'll share my latest collaboration, a musical and visual extravaganza, Christmas time in New Orleans. Monica Fitzgibbons of Aim Higher Recordings will help explain the world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Dick Morris, Dr. Bennett Omalu, and Monica Fitzgibbons are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout. You can find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo, or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. America's presidential candidates took center stage Wednesday at MSNBC's Commander-in-Chief Forum. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both aimed at positioning themselves as best prepared to lead the military and warning that their opponent would put the country at risk. Democrat nominee Hillary Clinton told the live audience that steadiness and strength are the two most important qualities for the president and that her own experience has prepared her for the job. What you want in a president, a commander-in-chief, is someone who listens, who evaluates what is being told to him or her, who is able to sort out the very difficult options being presented. You're talking about and then judgment. makes the decision, makes the decision. Clinton's ongoing email scandal was raised repeatedly. Uh, Moderator Matt Lauer and a veteran audience member asked her how she could be trusted. Given her use of a private email server as Secretary of State, Clinton insisted again that she did not jeopardize national security. And in an ever-evolving defense, she said she never used unsecure systems to handle classified material designated, quote, with clear headers, end quote. For his part, Donald Trump said that his great judgment and international business experience would help him to lead America. He hit Clinton for voting to go to war in Iraq and suggested that he would have a different set of generals in the fight against ISIS. I think under the leadership of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, the generals have been reduced to rubble. They have been reduced to a point where it's embarrassing for our country. And Donald Trump is not missing the opportunity to reach out to Christian voters. He speaks to the Value Voters Summit in D.C., this after being warmly welcomed by an African-American congregation in Detroit on Saturday. His campaign also released a video message aimed at Catholics ahead of Mother Teresa's canonization. Trump offered praise for what he described as St. Teresa's amazing life of charity and holiness. I'm truly happy to see Catholics across the world join together and celebrate Mother Teresa's uniquely humble, generous, and pious life. There was nobody like her. Trump didn't stop there. Out on the campaign trail in North Carolina on Tuesday, he quoted the Bible and St. John the Evangelist in a call for unity. But if we love one another... God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us, all of us. Imagine what our country could accomplish if we started working toward one people under one God saluting one flag. It's time... Not to be outdone, Hillary Clinton also shared her thoughts on Mother and Teresa. I was fortunate enough to know Mother Teresa. I was fortunate enough to actually work with her. We didn't agree on everything. 
but we found common ground. She asked me when I was first lady to get a home for babies started in Washington so mothers who couldn't care for their babies could take their babies to a safe place and those babies could be adopted. And when Mother Teresa asked you to do something, the only answer was yes, ma'am. And it was a difficult week for diplomacy abroad me. for President Barack Obama. It all started at the G20 summit in China with an apparent snub at the Hangzhou airport as the Chinese hosts refused to welcome the president with a red carpeted staircase, which was presented to other leaders. The move forced Obama to disembark Air Force One unceremoniously, using his own staircase at the rear of the plane. Then on the tarmac, a Chinese host scolded an Obama staffer, saying, this is our country, this is our airport. Later, the Chinese foreign minister suggested that it was not a snub at all, but a misunderstanding. Meanwhile, the new president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, called President Barack Obama a son of a, well, it's a family show. This week, prompting the White House to call off a bilateral meeting between the two men. Despite the slur, Obama met briefly with the Philippine president on the sidelines of a summit in Laos. And what appeared to be an icy stare down between President Barack Obama and Russian President Vladimir Putin summed up a sideline G20 meeting between those two leaders. The powers have failed to agree on a plan to stem the bloodshed in Syria. Obama said on Monday that the tone of his 90 minute meeting with Putin was candid, blunt, and businesslike. He did add that given the gaps of trust that exist, it's a tough negotiation. Their discussion came hours after top U.S. and Russian diplomats failed to finalize a deal to provide humanitarian aid to thousands of civilians in Syria and to collaborate militarily against extremist groups operating there. And President Barack Obama has nominated the first Muslim American to serve on the federal bench. On Tuesday, he announced the nomination of Abid Riaz Quersheri, to the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Mr. Kwasheri, an American of Pakistani heritage, is a graduate of Harvard Law School and currently a partner at the prestigious D.C. law firm of Latham and Watkins. Kwasheri's chances of confirmation appear low unless the U.S. Senate decides to hold hearings after the November 8th presidential election. Muslim groups are hailing the nomination as an important step in diversifying the federal judiciary. And another terror scare in France. Paris police have arrested a man on the country's terror watch list after his car was found packed with seven gas cylinders parked next to Notre Dame Cathedral. The vehicle was spotted Sunday with its hazard lights on, no license plates, and papers written in Arabic in the car. No detonator was found. Five other suspects were also brought in for questioning. Police believe the suspect could have been engaged in a test run. 13 million tourists visit Notre Dame Cathedral each year. France remains on high alert after three major terror attacks, killing more than 200 people beginning in 2015. And for the first time, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI has offered reflections about his pontificate excerpts of Peter Seewald's book-length interview with Benedict, entitled Last Testament in His Own Words, have emerged in European media. According to an excerpt in a German daily, Benedict discusses delicate matters, including the strengths and weaknesses of his pontificate, the so-called gay lobby, and Pope Francis. He mentions the burdens he felt when he was elected and how he knew precisely the dark side of the church. Benedict said pedophile priests, murky finances, and corruption were the filth which he wanted to eliminate, but they were hard to get rid of. And he wanted to do more, but he was unable to. He says he smashed a homosexual network in the Vatican. In another excerpt, Benedict admits that practical governance was not his strong point, and certainly a weakness. In reality, he said, I am more of a professor, one who reflects and meditates on spiritual questions. Speaking of his successor, Benedict said he was completely surprised and initially unsettled by the election of Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, 
but that he was later content and happy after seeing Pope Francis address the crowds from the balcony of St. Peter's. And a conservative Catholic icon passed away this week. Phyllis Schlafly, an early leader of the social conservative movement, died Tuesday at her home in St. Louis, Missouri. She was 92. Perhaps best known for her leadership against the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s, Schlafly first rose to prominence with her self-published bestseller, A Choice, Not an Echo. It became a manifesto for the conservative movement and is credited for helping Barry Goldwater secure the 1964 GOP nomination. In 1972, she founded the Eagle Forum, a national pro-family organization, and she would go on to become an influential pro-life and pro-family advocate. She recently endorsed Donald Trump, causing a split in her organization. Her latest book, The Conservative Case for Trump, was released on Tuesday, just a day after her death. May Phyllis Schlafly rest in peace. And images posted on Russian social media this week show a scene of almost biblical proportions. A river turned inexplicably blood red, according to a report by ABC. A river near the Arctic city of Norilsk turned a vivid shade of crimson. Frogs did not follow. So far, Russian authorities have declined to give a reason for the river's uncharacteristic appearance. However, locals have linked it to a large metal smelting factory upstream. Norilsk is known as one of the most polluted cities on Earth. It all sounds like something from my upcoming Will Wilder book. And speaking of that, the Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls and Mother Angelica audiobook giveaway continues. All you have to do is to qualify is email, tweet, or Facebook me a photo of you, your family, or friends reading one of the books. You can also send me a video telling me what you think of them. I'll select winners in a few weeks and send you autographed audiobooks. The details are at RaymondArroyo.com. Also, a quick reminder, I'll be at the EWTN Family Celebration on September 18th in Birmingham and then the National Book Festival here in D.C. on September 24th. And then we're doing a very special live conversation with best-selling children's author of Wonder, R.J. Palacio, at the Sheen Center in New York on October 2nd. For tickets and more, you can visit the website. Details are at the bottom of my homepage. When we return, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton faced off on foreign policy this week. Who came out on top? Political commentator and author of Armageddon, Dick Morris, is up next. The World Over continues in a moment. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton continue to battle it out for votes in this presidential race. The polls are said to be closing, but are they? And where is that all-important Catholic vote headed? To discuss it all, I'm joined now by political commentator, former Clinton advisor and author of the New York Times best-selling book, Seven Weeks on the Bestseller List, Armageddon. Would you welcome Dick Morris. Good to see you. Great to see you, but Dick. But don't forget my subtitle, which is my favorite, How Trump Can Beat Hillary. Well, let's get to that and see if, <laughs> if we're going there. Uh, a tr Trump seems to be emerging in a way, I guess the way you counseled Bill Clinton in 1996. You said he should triangulate. Tell people what that means, and is Trump actually doing that by running against both parties? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the idea of triangulation, which I brought to the White mm -hmm. House, was that instead of a sterile debate of the left against the right, take the best from each party, get rid of the worst, mm -hmm. and join at a third place. So uh, from the left, uh, higher additional, uh, have gun control, have handgun waiting periods, and from the right, have extra cops and extra p sentences, mm -hmm. and then combine them in an anti-crime program. And I think... With, in Trump's case, I use a different metaphor in my book, but it's the same thought. Mm. Republicans always fight with one hand, the right jab, uh, immigration, trade, social issues, taxes. Mm -hmm. Now we need to do that, but also throw the left hook and get the Bernie Sanders voters in. 
by speaking about income inequality, the uh, power of the banks, uh, the uh, need to have school choice, mm -hmm. and uh, go after votes we don't normally go after with an agenda that <laughs> the wonderful phrase I love to use from the White House days is, use your tools to fix their car. Oh. <laughs> We'll see, we'll see if Hillary Clinton or Trump are able to do that. On Wednesday night, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were asked to make their case for the position of commander-in-chief and defend their positions. Hillary Clinton had this to say when asked about her support for the war in Iraq. I have said that my voting to give President Bush that authority was, from my perspective, my mistake. Now, my opponent was for the war in Iraq. He says he wasn't. You can, you can go back and look at the record. He supported it. I happened to hear Hillary Clinton say that I was not against the war in Iraq. I was totally against the war in Iraq. From a, you can look at Esquire magazine from 04. You can look at before that. And I was against the war in Iraq because I said it's going to totally destabilize the Middle East, which it has. Now, Trump says he was against the war in Iraq, but we have been hearing for days now that Howard Stern interview from September 11th, 2002, where he says very clearly, are you for invading Iraq? And Donald Trump says, yeah, I guess so. I wish the first time it was done correctly. Does this matter? Well, no, I don't think so. I think everybody understands that Hillary was in the, was in the Senate. Uh, her support for the uh, war in Iraq was a pivotal factor in letting it happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, Donald Trump was a private businessman mouthing off on the Howard Stern show, for God's sakes. That's yeah. not for the benefit of your but, Christian but why audience. Keep, why that's keep, not a Christian show. <laughs> right, but, but, why, but why keep mentioning it? Well, why keep mentioning because, it if, 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 because there, if he clearly supported it? Well, he didn't support it. He opposed it like crazy when it was in, when it was in play mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 03 and 04, which mm -hmm. was the major period. He was against it. But the reason for raising it is that Hillary, at the start of this debate, said, this debate, should, what qualifications should someone have to be right. president? And she said, judgment and maturity and temperament and listening and mm -hmm. empathy. And uh, then she proceeded not to demonstrate any of that. And uh, I think that when Lauer said, okay, judgment, you had the email fight right. and you voted for the war, mm -hmm. where, where's that We're going to get to that in a moment. I, I want to play this first. Uh, Hillary Clinton was asked at one point about uh, the use of ground troops. And here's what she had to say, using ground troops in Iraq, in Syria. Watch. We are not putting ground troops into Iraq ever again, and we're not putting ground troops into Syria. She's taken a lot of criticism for that. Yeah. Valid? Well, uh, she's entitled to her position, but the fact is that she supported the war in Iraq. She was personally responsible for the war in Libya. Uh, I don't know if you're going to play that sound clip where she said, we didn't lose a single American in Libya. Well, how about Chris Stevens and the three guards in Benghazi? Those were Americans. They died in Libya. And uh, she also advocated a no-fly zone in Syria. But I want to talk more politics than substance. Yeah. The important thing about this campaign right now is that both Trump and Hillary have very high negatives. So it's right. a very volatile race. But Trump stemmed from what he has said and how he's acted. Hillary stemmed from what she's done, the email thing, Benghazi, and the conflicts of interest, the yeah. foundation. And it's easier to reverse what you said to clean up your act, as Trump has been doing, mm -hmm. than to roll back stuff you've done. And Hillary, I think, has fallen into a trap, an easy labor-saving device, which is she's built a campaign of expletives against Trump, uh, calling him everything in the world, racist, sexist, bombastic, a demagogue, a buffoon, uh, a, a, a dangerous, uh, unstable, unpredictable, a whole range of things. And then Donald Trump walks onto the set and you see him. And he's not any of those things. He's a perfectly reasonable guy who has some interesting ideas that are not out there in the political process and may make some sense. And all of a sudden, Hillary's adjectives don't work. Remember that historically, Barry Goldwater was painted that way by Johnson and lost. And McGovern was painted that way by Nixon and lost. When Carter tried to do it to Reagan, he couldn't. Why not? because Reagan had primetime TV debates and the other two didn't. Mm. People had a chance to watch him for three and a Reagan half or four hours. Reagan was also avuncular and an actor. And but Donald Trump 
let's face it, there are times where he comes across with that bluster and seems to confirm what Hillary Clinton said. Not saying. lately. Not in the last three weeks. I want to play this. This is an important moment. Hillary Clinton was asked once again about her emails and the use of that private server for handling classified information. Watch. Classified material has a header which says top secret, secret, confidential, nothing. And I will, I will repeat this, and this is verified in the report by the Department of Justice. None of the emails sent or received by me had such a header. How detrimental is this well, to Hillary Clinton? Very. And first of all, that is the first time she's ever said that. Never said it before. Mm. And secondly, uh, it's, it's disingenuous. The FBI said that there were 110 emails that were classified that passed through her private server. And then in retrospect, 2,000 that should have been classified. And She's saying that, oh, it always says classified on it. Right. Well, the clerk, the low-ranking officer who said that, for him, yeah, it's classified. It's not his decision to make. But the Secretary of State is the one who decides if it's classified or not. And the FBI report said that it is beyond the realm of possibility that somebody as high up as Hillary Clinton and Secretary of State would not know what was classified and would not know that this material should not be discussed. Don't you think the American voter, service? though, has factored all of this in, Dick Morris, and they, they now say, you know, the FBI cleared her, it's old history, and people just keep trying to revive this. Yeah. That's at least what you hear from the Clinton campaign. Yeah, this I, is over. I, well, they're, they're always saying it's over, but uh, it's not in the least bit over. First of all, uh, there are still a lot of emails that she deleted that she refused to turn over that are yet to come out. Mm -hmm. Secondly, with every new email comes new evidence of the pay for play, mm -hmm. that literally a majority of the people who had appointments with Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. were donors to the foundation. It's like they set out with a cash register and ka-ching, mm -hmm. the secretary will see you now. Mm -hmm. Now, you claim in the new book that uh, Armageddon, that Donald Trump could win this thing. Now, just, as a, just to play devil's advocate, in 2012, you said Mitt Romney was going to win by a landslide. In 2008, you said Hillary Clinton would face Condoleezza Rice. Why should people believe you now? Well, because in 2008, uh, I accurately predicted that Obama would win. In 2010, I was one of the only people in America who said the Republicans would win more than 60 seats in the House. In 2012, while I got the presidential race wrong, in 2014, I predicted exactly the Senate outcomes that we had. And the problem in 12 was there was a hurricane at the end that totally changed the electoral landscape and led to not only my being wrong, but Gallup, Rasmussen, CNN, and all of the major polling firms. Yeah because nobody was able to take into account the last-minute move to Obama when he was shown so brilliantly touring the sandy mm -hmm. battlefield. I've got to get into these polls before we run out of time. I want to put up the Catholic vote. And uh, there's been a recent uh, Public Opinion Research Institute poll. It tells us this, that Clinton is securing 55 percent of the Catholic vote, Trump 32 percent. Well, that's Latinos. No, that's overall. Yeah, but that's that, overall. So to Catholic, what do you attribute that, and how does he win them back? A third of the Catholic vote is Latino mm -hmm. in the United States. If you just took non-Latino white Catholics, mm -hmm. uh, Trump would actually be winning by a significant margin. The separate issue is not how do you address Catholics. He's doing fine. The issue is Latinos. And there, I think, you have to draw a distinction between the third of all Latinos who are voters, a quarter, who are themselves immigrants. To them, immigration is the issue, and Trump's position is anathema, and he'll never win them. But three-quarters of the Latino vote mm -hmm. um, was born here. They're American citizens, natural citizens, mm -hmm. uh, guys with Latino surnames like Arroyo. Yeah, well, and, I know a few. And for them, uh, in the polling, the most important issue is jobs and education and health care, followed by immigration. And I think Trump has a marvelous ability to win those voters. In your book, you lay out a strategy, and I want to end with this, on how Trump can win, how Hillary can win. But you say the strategy for Trump, the pathway, is win Virginia and then win a few of the toss-up states. 
When you look at the, in fact, Politico just came out with a battleground average of states. When you look at this, Colorado, which is one of the states you identify as a toss up, Hillary Clinton's up 10. When you look at New Hampshire, Hillary Clinton's up 7. When you look at Virginia, she's up 11. When you look at Pennsylvania, she's up 10. How can he possibly win losing well, these states or coming well, in here? First of all, the Politico story was based on polling data from August 1st to September 5th. Mm -hmm. Huge window. The beginning of that window, Hillary was winning from her post-convention bounce. By the end of that window, she was sucking air because of the uh, email scandal mm -hmm. and the pay for play. Uh, a more recent poll in Virginia has Hillary ahead by two. Uh, within the margin of error. Yeah, within the margin. Uh, but I think that before we get to the state-by-state -state analysis, which I think is premature at this point, the real question is, when people see Donald Trump and learn that he is not a scary monster and we have to run screaming if he's elected, and then what is the argument left for Hillary? She hasn't posed any other. And she has yet to sit down and decide on a message. Is she going to continue Obama's economic policies or fundamentally change them? Is she going to continue to fight ISIS the way he is or fundamentally change it? Mm -hmm. Is she going to continue with Obamacare as it falls apart or fundamentally change it? Is she running as an insurgent or as a continuation of Obama? Is she a change agent or a status quo agent? She won't resolve that. And I think that Hillary has no message. And she fell into a trap of vilifying Trump, and that became her message. Dick Morris, thanks for the analysis. The book is Armageddon, How Trump Can Beat Hillary Clinton. It's available now at bookstores everywhere and online at dickmorris.com. When we return... And Amazon. Don't. And Amazon, okay. When we return, football is an American tradition. But as the NFL season begins, forensic pathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu shares disturbing findings with me on sports-related concussions, and he has a warning... For athletes that you do not want to miss, the world over continues in a moment. Stay right there. When I was a boy, heaven was here, and America was here. You could be anything, you could do anything. I never wanted anything as much as I wanted to be an American. Hearts here in Pittsburgh are broken over the loss of Hall of Famer Mike Webster, who had in recent years suffered from mental illness and slipped into financial ruin. Why does an apparently healthy favorite son of this city die in disgrace at 50? That was Will Smith portraying my next guest in the movie Concussion. Dr. Bennett Omalu is a forensic pathologist from Nigeria who performed an autopsy on NFL Hall of Famer Iron Mike Webster, and he discovered a condition called CTE. His is a story of faith and finding the courage to speak the truth, even in the face of fierce resistance. And his warning to young athletes about the danger of concussions is something you need to hear. I spoke with him recently via satellite from Sacramento, California. Here's my exclusive interview with Dr. Bennett Omalu. Dr. Omalu, thank you for being here. I want to take you back to 2002. You are in the Pittsburgh area, and a former NFL player, uh, Mike Webster, is brought to you. He is deceased. His autopsy seemed to be normal, yet you decided to go back and do further testing. What made you do that? Well, what made me do that was my faith, and, um I saw myself in Mike Webster. We share a common image, the image of God. Um, mm -hmm. And the morning I did his autopsy, I had heard about him on television. Uh, news and comment on women were talking about him, the difficult life he had. Uh, he suffered a depression and so many other problems he had. And in my life mm -hmm. in medical school, I, I too suffered a depression. So that morning, I saw him, I, I spoke to him, I, I talked to my patients, I spoke to his spirit uh, mm -hmm. and promised him that I would use all my knowledge to get to the bottom of his problem to find out answers 
So when, when I did the autopsy and his brain looked normal, I was not satisfied. I had to dig deeper in search of the truth. And you discovered, you were really the first person to discover this uh, protein collection, an accumulation of protein on the brain. You defined it as CTE. Tell people what that is and why did you call it that? Well, CTE was the name I gave the disease after I was convinced it had not been described before in uh, a football player or any other person outside boxing. We knew about mm -hmm. dementia pugilistica and that was it. We had associated brain damage with boxing and with no other sport. So when I saw right. the changes, I had to give it a name rather than just publishing it as a scientific curiosity. So I, I engaged in branding. Mm -hmm. And I chose CTE because it had been used in the past uh, in a, as a descriptive terminology. Because in the court of law, there's what is called the Dobbert principle. Um, a scientific concept has to be recognized as a generally accepted principle to be accepted in the court of mm -hmm. law, and it needs to have precedence. So I chose CTE, mm -hmm. Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy, because it had a good acronym, but at the same time, it sounded intellectually sophisticated and erudite. All right. Now, doctor, were you prepared for the NFL's reaction? They were none too pleased with your findings. In fact, they issued a statement saying they were completely wrong. They demanded a retraction. They tried to discredit you. What was that like? Well, um, you know, what I did was in search of the truth. And I'm a, I'm a devout Catholic by faith. Mm-hmm. And when you read the Bible, Jesus instructed us or reminded us constantly that we should not be afraid. And even mm. in the Gospel of John, it tells us that when you do something in truth and in love, you boldly step out into the light so that it's clearly seen that what you do is being done in love. So when mm -hmm. I studied the NFL, because I did not grow up in America, I, I knew nothing about the NFL. So I began studying the NFL. I began studying the culture of football in the mm -hmm. United States. And I discovered that the NFL may have been systematically and systemically concealing the truth that playing football damages the human brain. So I embraced my faith. I stood um, grounded, embedded in my faith with a breastplate of <laughs> love. I was doing what I was doing out of love of my fellow mankind. So hmm. I, I wanted the truth to be told. I spent my own money. I traveled across the country to, hmm. to fight for the truth. And we should tell people, you're, you were interviewing family members, you were examining other deceased players, examining their brains, doing autopsies, and extensive study into the nature of their brain injuries. And there seemed to be a pattern here. In fact, the NFL has paid over a billion dollars now in settlements based on your research. Do you feel vindicated that you've changed the NFL? Have you? Have you changed the NFL in any way? No, no, I, I'm, I don't feel vindicated because this has never been about me. But I think mm. the thousands of retired football players, college football players, high school football players that had been suffering in silence and in obscurity, they had no answers mm -hmm. to the questions why they were suffering, what they were suffering. I think they have been vindicated. People like Mike Webster, Terry Long, Andrew Waters, and so many others, they have been vindicated mm -hmm. just like I promised Mike Webster that I was going to vindicate him. The truth has vindicated mm -hmm. them. And I think Will Smith, by playing me in the movie Concussion, has contributed tremendously in the enlightenment mm -hmm. of the society. 
And I think everybody out there must know that playing football damages your brain. Whether you, you wear a helmet or not, whether you suffer a concussion or not. And if the, the younger you are when you begin playing football, the greater the likelihood that you would damage your brain. And look, as a Christian so and as a scientist. Doctor, what, what, what would be your message then to parents, to kids watching right now? There are a lot of people playing football all over the country. You would say what to them? My message is that science tells us that as a society, we evolve. And faith also tells us that we must constantly renew our minds and embrace mm -hmm. the new self while giving up the old self. We must change. Mm -hmm. As we become more intelligent, we give up the less intelligent things of the past. Playing football damages the human brain. If you're an adult, you're afraid to do whatever you want to do, and I will be the first to stand by you to defend your right and freedom to do whatever you want to do. But for children, I strongly believe by my science and my faith that children should not be playing contact football. And not just football, wow. other high impact contact sports like ice hockey, like what? boxing, mm -hmm. wrestling, rugby. It damages their brains. And I've done so many autopsies on young children in their 20s and in their teens mm. who played football when they were six, seven years old. And in their yeah. 20s, they, they lose their memory. They, they suffer from disinhibition. Mm. They engage in criminal activities. They abuse drugs. They become alcoholics, all because they played mm. football. And this is a fact. Mm. I'm not, I don't intend to scare anybody. When you seek the truth yeah. and embrace the truth, the truth is enlightening. The truth actually sets you free. It's liberating. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be afraid Doctor, like I wanna... Jesus has called us to. Mm. Doctor, I want to explore something you mentioned earlier. You said when, when Mike Webster, who was really the first player that brought this condition to your attention and where you discovered it in his brain, you said you talked to his spirit. Now, I've met with an awful lot of medical examiners to research books and other things. I find there is a common link of faith in many of these men. Even if they're not practicing it, there is a, an awareness that they're dealing with something and someone sacred. How does your faith assist you in the examination of the dead and help you weather the many storms that you have since your finding? My, my faith is what defines who I am. Um, I'm a physician, a scientist. I live my life by an amalgamation of my faith and science, because faith seeks the truth. Mm -hmm. Science also seeks the yeah. truth. And both my faith and science have taught me, having done over 8,000 autopsies, that death mm -hmm. is a continuum. It's not the end of who mm -hmm. we are. We have a spiritual aspect of us, and we have a physical aspect. Both go together. Now, when you pass on, the bodily form dies, but your spirit lives on. It's a continuum, mm. but because we, uh, mankind, we don't have answers. There is so much we do not know. Science can never provide all the answers. In fact, the more you know in science, the more you realize what you do not know. And same applies to faith. So by my faith and science, there is no end. That end is God. And so when I see a dead person and I'm performing an autopsy, I talk to the spirit of that person because his spirit is alive. And I've done so mm. many cases, like Mike Webster's case. People have asked me, why did you save his brain when you did not see any abnormality? I don't have answers. I don't know. OK, I, even mm. after I examined his brain, I did not see any changes. Why did I continue? 
I don't know. In right. fact, I should not have even done an autopsy on Mike Webster because we knew why he died. He had a massive heart attack. But I still did his autopsy. Huh. You ask me why I did it, I don't know. Possibly Mike <laughs> Webster's spirit was guiding me. Who knows? We don't have answers to hmm. that. But we should not dismiss it. Yeah. Before I let you go, Boston University was to accord you an honor, a special honor. They alerted you to this honor forthcoming in the spring. Now they have suddenly canceled it. They said, uh, we've had a change in our gala. We've decided to go in a different direction. You don't think it's as simple as that? Well, doctors and some individuals in Boston University have been the single group who have attacked me most vehemently, who have denied mm -hmm. my work, who have ridiculed me and dehumanized me. And I find that quite contradictory. Because um, when I just started, I remember I traveled to Boston to show my slides to them. Um, the mm -hmm. work, I think, by dismissing me, they are actually dehumanizing Mike Webster, Terry Long, Andrew Waters, Chris Benoit. These were the people in whose death we learned a lot from. Um, but as mm. a Christian, it doesn't really bother me, to be honest with you. This has never mm. been about me. Um, yeah. In my journey thus far, the NFL is not the group that has attacked me most. Uh, groups of people that have attacked me most and denied my work are my fellow physicians, my people mm. who are meant to be my colleagues. Why mm. it is mm. the way it is, I do not know. To be honest with you, I, I, I don't care. Because when you embrace mm. love in your life, Every other thing is secondary. You focus on the love and the light of the mighty God. That is what I'm doing. And I forgive mm. everybody. I forgive everybody. So, yeah. um, but I, I pray there will have a change of heart. And um, yeah. um, like Jesus said mm -hmm. to Mary Magdalene, woman, your sins have been forgiven you, but go and sin no more. We, we are all one brothers mm. and sisters. This has never been about me, and I, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be in the yeah. service of our common humanity, as I'm just um, yeah. well, a messenger. Uh, we all are one body, one spirit, well, one well, love. Let us have one another, because we are members of one another. Well, as I read the concussion book, which was before the movie, uh, it's so clear there. The research stands on its own, but the drama that that the research created, but isn't that the story anytime truth is brought out there are those who feel threatened, injustices start to prey on this individual, and it seems to me you've weathered it and you've taken the right path, and you're still standing, still doing your research. What's next, doctor? Well, what's next? Um, I see it as my Calvary. Um, I never asked for this. Um, so what's next? It's, I'm writing a memoir. Um, the title is mm. Truth, Truth Doesn't Have a Side so that I could help anyone ah. else out there who is experiencing his or her own Calvary. Then I may mm -hmm. be working on a TV show with some um, people. We are at uh, very preliminary phases um, to create mm. something that will be American, something beautiful that will bring joy to so many mm -hmm. people. And to be honest with you, Excellent. I'm in total surrender to the will of God. Um, there, for the, will, um, for the will of God, go I. I've forgotten how it's said. But I'm open um, to the will of God in my life. May his will be done in my life, especially in service of my fellow man. And also some people mm. set up a foundation, um, Bennett Amalo Foundation. They named it after me. I did not want it, but they insisted. So through that foundation, I could um, help other researchers like myself uh, invest on individual mm. ingenuity to possibly discover a cure for CTE. People could go to the website. Very it's good. Foundation.org.
Very good. Dr. Bennett Omalo, thank you so much for being here and for your candor and your groundbreaking research. Thank you, sir. An important interview. When we return, Christmas time is coming, and so is a brand new musical extravaganza I've been working on, and it features my hometown. Monica Fitzgibbons of Aim Higher Recordings is up next to help me tell you all about it. The world over continues in a moment, and you need a little Christmas. Stay tuned. Back to the world over live. Couldn't we all use a little Christmas now and then? I hear that music. It takes me back. I know it's only September, but I wanted to share with you a new project that I have been working on for a couple of years, and it concerns two of my favorite things, Christmas and my hometown of New Orleans. The festive spirit, the faith, the traditions of the people are captured in a new documentary and CD called Christmas Time in New Orleans. Full disclosure, I'm a co-producer on the project, and it's very dear to me to discuss the new CD available worldwide from Verve on September 9th. I'm joined, pleased to be joined, by my partner for this endeavor, co-founder of Aim Higher Recordings, Monica Fitzgibbons. Great nice to, see, to you. see you. Raymond. I'm delighted we could do this and, and share this with the audience. Uh, tell people about the origins of this project. This came in a <laughs> big roundabout <laughs> way and with fits and starts, but it did have an interesting kernel at the beginning. It did. Well, uh, you know, it kind of started with, well, everybody loves Raymond's New Orleans. And uh, it's very intriguing to hear you talk about it. We've all heard you talk about New Orleans over the years on the show. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, Kevin and I have these record companies. And we've always wanted to do a really classic jazz big band, you know, mm -hmm. but, but we don't really do projects anymore unless they have serious human interest stories that, that are centered around the family and faith and, you know, and they're, they're all different. Yeah. So here was your New Orleans and here was our jazz thing. Well, it's a very, fa people don't think of it that way, but it actually from the inside is a very family centered society. It's where the music comes from it's where the food comes from and of course the documentary gets into all that the PBS special but what I love is this is an original band that you brought together we talked early on about we need to do something jazz and it couldn't be real progressive stuff we wanted right. something really traditional yeah. um, and I love the Count Basie thing yeah. and we discussed that and you put it all together Tell me where it came from. Where did these people come from? Who are these Insanity. NOLA players? That's where it came from. No. You know, it was probably a work of the Holy Spirit because, you know, through doing this by no intention of either one of us, I think it really did through music and through food and through Raymond is the host of this of the special. great special and wrote really everything that we see because who else could do that? You know, it's so personal to you having grown up there. Yeah. And so, but you asked about the band. It wasn't for us, you know, we didn't want a name, we didn't want a gimmick, we just wanted the Christmas best songs. players. Yeah. And that's on, always yeah. been, you know, it's we're so great. free it's, to it's do cool. that now that we have our own labels. So we went in and got 18 of the literally best jazz players and from the birthplace of jazz. Yeah, well, I, I want to share a little of this with you. This is uh, Terrence Taplin, who's the, 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 actually, I think he plays the trombone. Yeah, in the, trombone. But he's also a trumpeter. Um, he talks, and some of the other band members of the NOLA players talk about this Christmas time in New Orleans CD watch. Life. Life is the secret. It comes through the music. It's about the fraternity of it all. Every time I see him, it's, it's all love. You know, everybody feeds off that. Right. Exactly. 
I think when it comes to music, a lot of times people get caught up in, in trends. Uh, you know, what is the new thing? And this, this isn't just pop music, this is classical jazz. I would say that the music itself has the elements of New Orleans, not only with the grooves, but with the tempo too. The community of musicians playing together with New Orleans, which has its own sort of holidays that they celebrate, and so Christmas, there's its own traditions that New Orleans has. So I think that New Orleans will put its own spin on it, and that's what this record has. What I love about this band is how diverse it is. You have um, a, a, a Caucasian arranger, and then you have black and Hispanic, and uh, the, it's really a, an entire rainbow of races and cultures yeah. that came together, and it really is reflective of the city as a whole. Yes, and you know, and, and we went there, and we spent time there, and. You know, the thing that really amazed me was how the, the quiet Catholicism that that city is knit together through. Right down to, you know, their football team is called the Saints and their their cities are called parishes. Right, our Your counties. Cities. Our counties are Your called counties. parishes, yeah. And so all of a sudden you start to realize that a lot of these guys grew up going to these Catholic schools together. Or, I mean, it's this French and Spanish and Creole and gumbo. I mean, it's said a lot throughout the it's special. It's a gumbo. It's a gumbo, and now we know that the gumbo isn't just something going on in the food. Right. Well, I think it's also a lesson to the rest of the country where we see racial division exploding. In New Orleans, there is this melding of cultures, and because everybody is so reliant on the other for the things we love and cherish most, from our food to our festivals to the music, and I love that this CD has captured the spirit, the zest, uh, the drive, even the tempo of the people. It's yeah. a little, it's not your, it's not yeah. peppy Chicago jazz. It's right. that kind of laid back. Yeah. Uh, and you hear that in the arrangements and the execution, certainly. Yeah, well, when we sat down to do the sessions, as you talked about, you know, they were in the round. And we recorded yeah. this album actually in the round at the historic Sanger Theater, mm. one of your favorite theaters. My, the theater I love most in the world. It's where I saw these amazing Broadway productions. I saw Rex Harrison there, Yul Brenner, all these monumental performers, singers, dancers, everybody. So for me personally, when you said, we're gonna record this at the Sanger, I thought... I saw your face. Like a that. dream come true. I mean, of all the places <laughs> in the world, you're thinking we're gonna do this in a little dusty recording studio somewhere. No, no we don't Sanger. do that. It was spectacular. We're into doing very authentic recording situations that no one ever thinks will work. But in this situation, you know, Again, the common language was music, too, mm -hmm. and it was everybody bringing their A-game, and there were no attitudes. And again, we like to do these collaborative projects where everybody's kind of doing this team thing, and it's crazy, yeah. uh, you know, but, but it's great. And then there you are in the middle of it, sort of, you know, guiding it along, and it just, it's so beautiful. When I watch this special, I find myself smiling and catching myself smiling. Yeah. Listening to the music, I find myself just singing along. It's going to be an awesome oh, no, no. The decorate music your Christmas is infectious. tree. It is infectious. It's, and the, the, just it's something for the family to yeah. gather around. We're going to play you a little clip. Uh, this is Christmas Time in New Orleans, the feature track Christmas in New Orleans, which um, recorded at the Sanger, but it'll give you a sense of uh, the people and the, the zeal and the zest that went into making this recording. Listen, watch.
So that's a little bit from uh, the LP, Christmas Time in New Orleans. Uh, now, this is a companion piece. These two pieces go together. Correct. The, the CD is in stores now. The DVD won't be appearing for a couple of months, and it's a PBS special that will be seen nationally and on EWTN. Um, but tell me what's at the heart of this for you as you listen to that music. Well, I think the heart of it is family. And, it, you know, it, there really was, it, first of all, it's an album that you, everybody in the family is going to love. Yeah. All different generations are going to love it. It's classic, but it's just, again, it's just made for all ages. The special, something that the whole family can watch, something that we've lost. And, you know, some of this is just selfish. Wanted an album, new Christmas album to listen to with the family. Wanted a special that we could watch with the whole family. Yeah, and it's fun. It's, they're human comedies throughout this thing that we didn't anticipate no. that pop up. And we'll share that with you in the coming weeks. But in the meantime, the CD is available everywhere. Tell me, when I heard that this CD that we had labored on and that you have really labored on, was going to be released by Verve, yeah. this classic label. That was big. You thought what? I just, well, I just thought, you know, how could this be any better? I mean, Verve is the classic, oh, you know, It's roots. the jazz icon. This is yeah. the label of Sarah Vaughn, I mean, Ella Fitzgerald, logo, Oscar Peterson. You know, and, and just the history of it. And, of course, now Tony Bennett's son has taken it over. And, I mean, the whole situation came together literally after we've been working on it like anything else you toil on mm -hmm. then all of a sudden boom it all came together in the last minute and then you just have to be ready and and the and the christmas gift is now upon you monica fitzgibbons oh, thank you for being here such a joy and and in the days ahead we'll expose people to the rest of this christmas time in new orleans featuring the nola players is available on cd in stores everywhere on itunes and soon from the ewtn catalog at EWTNRC.com. The Christmas Time in New Orleans special will be airing on public television starting in November, and we'll broadcast a special EWTN version, kind of a teaser for you. Well, that's all the time we have, but what a show we have next week. Jerry's back. And every interviewer has his own little shtick. Now, wait a minute, Jerry. It's okay. Not every interview. It's okay. Some of us are fresh and in the moment all the time, Jerry. Yes, you, <laughs> you, I know that you are. I have shtick and lots of it. Some of it I picked up from you. Join us next week for my exclusive new interview with Hollywood legend Jerry Lewis. He talks about his new film, Max Rose. Until then, the fun continues on Facebook and Twitter. Find me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And be sure to sign up for my free e-blast. Until then. We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.